Welcome back, friends. I am really excited for this episode of the Holistic Ease podcast and vlog. Today, I have with me a guest, Misty Lampa, a friend of mine, and she is a mom of four, a business owner. She lives in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. She is someone who I feel encapsulates what it means to live a holistic lifestyle and to do it with integrity and to do it with purpose and to do it with a sense of soul. So welcome, Misty. We're so excited to have have you here today and we're going to talk a little bit about your background how you got into yoga and holistic lifestyle and then we're going to chat a bit about intuitive eating because here at the beginning of the year we see so much diet culture all around us and i know that you have found a different way to relate to food through more of an intuitive approach to life in general a mindful approach to life in general right so welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the vlog. And can you just share a little bit about your background, your story, and how you got into holistic lifestyle? Yeah, thank you, Erin. Yeah. Um, so really my backstory is I was a college athlete. I played soccer in college. And um, I think it's really funny looking back because I would have Diet Coke on the sidelines of my <laughs> soccer. <laughs> <laughs> and I probably had like gummy bears or something and just, you know, just toxic, toxic, toxic. And, um, I didn't care as long as it wasn't full of fat. And, uh, that's what I cared about at the time. So pretty funny looking back. Um, after my college career, I moved out to the East coast and did an internship with, um, a few different, um, companies for their corporate health. So it was really fun. I got to work at the Boston Herald and, Tip O'Neill Government Center, a bunch of fun places out east. And um, along the way, I stumbled upon hot yoga. Oh, and amazing. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I heard about it and I lived in Boston. And so I really wanted to try it. And it was really the first time that I felt like, first of all, it was a hard workout, which is what I wanted being an athlete. <clears throat> and then second of all, it was the first time that I had to sit with myself for an hour and a half. And like stare at myself in the mirror and be like, what the heck is going on? I don't know how to deal with myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I kind of decided I needed more of that. So when I lived on the East Coast, I probably took hot yoga three, four or five days a week and um, really mostly for the physical. And it wasn't until I moved back to Minnesota, I decided to pursue my yoga teacher training. Um, and that was in 2000. 11 and that was fun because I was super pregnant with my second son oh. and I had yeah I had him like in the middle of the training and then I went back a couple of days Ooh. later but they were so great I was like nursing and taking yoga oh. training and it was really cute that's so, awesome yeah yeah and then so, that kind of spiraled into like we moved to this area and it really didn't have a lot of yoga and it didn't have hot yoga and I really still love the hot the heat the heat mm-hmm. um and So I, at some point, decided to open up my own studio. That's amazing. So it all started because of hot yoga. And I like what you said there, that it was the first time where you really had to encounter yourself in a sense of stillness and and having to actually work a little bit on that inner dialogue and that mindfulness. So what was that process like for you when you were, you know, confronting that side of yourself for the first time? Um, Like scary and weird and to do with it (laughs) pretty much until at some point you're forced to face it right right so yeah so I kind of just I kind of use the here's how I kind of explain it in terms of yoga so and this is how I kind of teach my classes now too a bit is like you might come to the yoga mat at first and you're like, Oh, okay. Some things are coming up. Some things are coming up. I might deal with it here. But then as soon as I step off my mat, I'm back to my regular life. Mm -hmm. And that was me for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And, and I think eventually the more different types of yoga you take and the more you surround yourself with that energy in some way, whether it's yoga or whatever mindful practice you have, Mm -hmm. um, you, you kind of figure you get to a point where you, you have, it, it sort of makes its way into you off of the mat or mm-hmm. off of the practice or off of wherever you are, you know, mm-hmm. and eventually mm-hmm. you're like, okay, I know I need to deal with this stuff and 
I should probably start doing that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's incredible. And I do think that I do find that, that even being in silence is something that a lot of people really struggle with because then they're having to hear those inner thoughts and those inner dialogues. And, and there's a lot of fear of leaning into that and starting to work through those things. But what I find with yoga is, you know, yoga is, uh, is not just what we think of as yoga. You know, it's not just the poses on the mat and the class, but it's an entire approach to life. And there's different aspects of yoga. So the fact that it started to infuse itself into the rest of what you're doing is so cool because that's exactly what that was designed to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So then you ventured into being a business owner. And so tell me what really inspired you you know, so you're in a small town. I'm in a really small town. Um, we're both lucky enough to have yoga where we are, but when you don't have it and you need it, it's horrible. <laughs> so were you just wanting to provide that service for people? Were you seeing like a greater vision with what you were doing? Cause I know that you have, um, yoga, fitness, and nutrition are kind of the three mm -hmm. parts of your business that you emphasize, correct? Yeah. So I started out actually my company name, 180 Balance, started as a nutrition company mm -hmm. and I would just do like meal plans for people and kind of work with mostly athletes or women wanting to lose weight. And mm -hmm. which is funny because I'm so like totally against like what I started with kind of, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's really what it started with. And then I always taught like fitness classes. So I had been teaching at our local community center and um, you know, I just, I just knew I wanted a different atmosphere for the yoga and, and we really tried to work something out where we would work, I would work something at the student or at the community center that I was working at, but my vision was just so different from there is that eventually I just said, you know what, I love this place. I've had a great experience. So I just, I need to like do it. Then I actually tried to get other people to open a studio. Like I didn't want to be a business owner. I, I just wanted to like teach people how to teach and I wanted to missed the side of it but nobody oh can you hear me yep yep i think we're okay hard. sorry that's okay i think we're back on i yep. think you can hear I me now good. yeah so, so you're talking about how you didn't want to be a business owner, but you ended yeah, up. Yeah, I didn't want to. I ended up like, I was trying to get other people to open a studio and just mm -hmm. me help manage it or whatever. But eventually my husband convinced me to just do it. Like, let's just do it ourselves. We can do, you can do this. And so I did. And, um, and then it was really funny because I thought just everybody would show up if I opened up a yoga studio and nobody showed up like at all. So you had to find, figure out marketing, right? <laughs> Yeah, I would have like two people that followed me from the community center where I'd have like 40 people in classes, you know, and then I was like, well, okay, this is humbling. <laughs> so it's a process and it's so interesting. I find this to be true with a lot of people that are in the healing realm is that they initially resisted going into the space where they were actually going to be the most effective in bringing their message and their work forth into the world. Mm. Um, I find this with myself too. It's like, oh, I, somebody else could do that. Somebody else would do that better. And I think it's a really good lesson for those of us that are feeling that resistance to maybe explore that space a bit more. And maybe some of the fears behind it that we have aren't what they think that they are. You know, there's just a lot of different reasons why we might resist that. But it might be the very thing that we're resisting that is actually what we're called to do. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I really like about what you said is that you started out doing nutrition plans for people. And now that's something that you don't really align with. And I think that we need to normalize that. Like as, as we grow as healers, we can't, you know, there's this expectation. I think a lot of us have for ourselves that, Oh, I need to know everything. I need to be totally a, a complete whole healed person before I can move into healing work before I can instruct other people. But it's actually the process of us working through that, that is the most powerful for other people to observe. So tell me about the shift that you made then from helping women diet into being a more of an intuitive eater yourself and helping others with that as well. Cause that's a big shift. Yeah, that's a big shift. Um, and actually I totally find what you said, totally true as well. I, if I had known that how much opening a business and like putting myself out there in that business would change me 
you know, mm. I, I like, I always say like the studio has saved me over and over and mm. over again, you know, mm -hmm. it's just been really powerful. So, mm. um, you know, uh, my thoughts on nutrition, uh, I think once you just start to, um, feel your body and feel y your own wisdom, I, I just couldn't, I don't, I don't know when that timeline was. I can't describe like a certain time where I just stopped believing what I believed before. And I still do believe in like eating, you know, balanced nutrition of eating, you know, in general, like macronutrients, so you protein, carbohydrates, and fat. I still believe in that, um, but I'm not rigid. And I, I believe that you know your body better than I do, that I can't tell you what you need, that you have to get quiet enough to learn what you need mm -hmm. for yourself. And mm -hmm. I don't know exactly when that shift happened, but but it happened and, and I couldn't go back to thinking any other way once I figured that out. And once I realized that, no, I, I know if I'm quiet enough, I can hear what my body needs and I can feel when something doesn't sit well with me and when things do sit well with me and what energizes me and what depletes me and what mm -hmm. all those things. So yeah, I don't know when the shift happened, but again, I just think it's, you know, that was something that I was hoping to, that would come up naturally and it totally did. But I think, Anytime you're immersed in, and not totally immersed, anytime you're even dipping your toes and coming back regularly into some sort of energetic body practice, mm -hmm. you're, again, you're just forced to listen. Mm -hmm. And when you listen, you can't deny what is happening any longer. Amen, sister. Amen. We need so much more of this. And this is a big part of my work too, is to reconnect people to their intuition. Cause I feel that we've become so disconnected from it. Um, that it's like, we don't trust, we don't even trust that we could possibly hear an inner voice. And that if we did hear an inner voice, it would tell us the truth. Like there's just a lot of layers of, um, self-limiting beliefs about that. I think that exist. And then there's the other side of things where it's like the diet culture has told us that things have to be a certain way in order for us to feel and look the way that we want to. So there's a lot of undoing, I think, of false beliefs that happens when you get into some kind of mindfulness or intuitive work. Um, now, I'm curious for you, there is a formal practice called intuitive eating capital I, capital E. There's a book by the same name. You can go and get trained in it. Um, so that's a, an aspect of intuitive eating, but I'm hearing what you're saying is that you first came to intuitive eating, not through formal instruction in that, but mm -hmm. through your mindfulness practice. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I've never taken formal intuitive eating training. I am certified nutritionist and probably have all the certifications out there for <laughs> nutrition <laughs> and have taught it for like 20 years, but, um, but honestly, none of that really matters. It's, it's what my own practice with myself has taught me. So if you had to define intuitive eating, how would you define it if you were explaining it to a client? What I do when I work with clients is help them settle down their head okay. and tune into what's going on. So that might mean like we do you know, some sort, I don't, I don't like rules. I don't like anything like that. So yeah. when I say like journaling, I mean it really just loosely, mm -hmm. but just being aware of like what your body feels like after you eat something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what's happening to your skin, what's happening to your digestive system when you're going to the bathroom, you know, what color is your, what color are things? What is it liquid? Is it solid like those types of things are going to tell you exactly what, what types of food are right or wrong for you yeah and yeah there's some guesswork and there's some things that you can do and if somebody's struggling with a particular issue you know it, it may be something I can help them pinpoint through trial and error you know of like okay probably is this food let's see what happens if you don't have that for a bit mm -hmm. and see how you feel so it's it's a bit of just practicing um but I think again, going back to this culture, it's such a quick fix culture that um, it, it's not very many people who are ready and willing to do that deep work of the listening and of the really figuring out what works for them. Yeah. I feel like if we could approach it with more of a sense of curiosity and play and see it as mm -hmm. an experiment rather than this is, this is something I need to fix and check off my list and then I'm done. 
you know, instead of looking at it as real type A to actually approach it a little bit more from the type B side of things. And like you said, more loosely, but it's hard for people to give themselves permission to do that. I feel so totally. Yeah. So when you started eating more intuitively, I'm curious to know for you and everybody is different, right? So what works for Misty or what works for me is not going to be what works for the next person, but I'm curious to see from your standpoint, what did you notice when you started really tuning in about your food? What kind of benefits did you notice? What kind of things did you notice were bothering you? Um, I knew I was um, sensitive to, let's say like gluten. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and then I did like a a cleansing process. um, And, and when I kind of eliminated stuff from my you know, I did like a two day cleanse. And when I eliminated the stuff from my, from my eating and tried to put it back in knowing I was already sensitive to it, it became more and more sensitive. And I just, sometimes it's worth it. Like sometimes I want a freaking cupcake and I'm going to have a cupcake and I love (laughs) cupcakes. Yeah. And then I'm going to pay for it because my stomach's going to hurt. Then I'm going to have sharp pains in my stomach. My throat gets like coated and, and scratchy and I don't feel good. And my digestive system's all messed up. Um, but it's worth it sometimes. And I'm okay with that. I, I just have that knowledge. And I also have the respect for my body to not do that most of the time. Ooh, I love so, what you just said there. <laughs> That's yeah. a version of self-love to be able to respect what your body is needing and telling you. And I talk about that with a lot of women I work with because we'll, let's say we'll like connect a couple of times a month or something. And it's so interesting to see, again, just that diet culture and that shame around food. Mm -hmm. So I'll have so many women and it's like clockwork, you know, like, oh my gosh, I was so bad this week. I ate, I'm like, what do you mean you were bad? Like, does that define who you are when you ate a damn cupcake? No, Mm -hmm. it doesn't define who you are. You ate a cupcake. Like, (laughs) Exactly. Did you enjoy it? Yes. Well, then why are you ashamed of it? Like you weren't bad. It's not bad. Just not that nutritious. Get over it. Yeah. Yes. Love that. I, you know, the shame spirals that we go through with food are extremely intense. Um, and it's something that we almost, so here is where my, my mindset was for a long time. I felt like the only way I would be able to lose or maintain my weight is if I punished myself by depriving myself and shaming myself. Like if I wasn't using that shame as a tool, I wouldn't be successful. How wrong is that? (laughs) Like, do you find people being more successful when they can let go of shame? I'm curious to know from your, from your experience. Oh my gosh, a hundred percent, but it's such a mindset shift. And I feel like, again, that just goes back to like your other practices and Mm -hmm. really has nothing to do with food. Mm -hmm. it just all kind of works together so even like the practice of you know teaching people like law of attraction and like the more that you are like I don't want to have this weight on me I don't want well what are you bringing on to yourself you're Mm -hmm. you're you're asking your body to not let go of that you're asking your body to highlight that weight that you have that you don't want to let go of that you hate and just bringing more of that to yourself instead of you know, I appreciate my body for what it's done for me. Mm-hmm. My body has held me for so long. It's supported me through everything that it's gone through, that I have gone through. It, it has been there for me. And, you know, maybe now is it's time to love myself so much that I don't need this extra love to hold on to. Yeah. You know? Yes. Yes. So much, so much. So if somebody's at the point where they're like, yes, I resonate with what you're saying, Misty. I know that my mindset right now is crap. I know that I need to shift it. I don't know where to start. What do you tell somebody when they're at the beginning of that journey? Find something that works for you as far as a mindful practice, whether it's energy healing, whether it is yoga, whether it is meditation, whatever it is, like Mm -hmm. find that first because you have to get your head in the game first. It okay. just has to be there. Okay. Um, and then as far as eating, like, let's look at what you're eating and see if we can find a few things to just swap out that are a, a little bit more nutritious. So you're going to get that higher vibrational food. And when you're putting that higher vibrational food in your body, it's going to work with your mind. It kind of all works together, but we don't have to go from eating 
you know, McDonald's to eating a salad every day, Mm -hmm. you know, that's not, that's not the goal. And that's, that's not helpful. That's not useful in your body either. So Mm -hmm. just starting to make small changes that are a a bit more nutritious and a bit more higher vibing foods. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully worth that with the mindful practice, you'll be able to slowly adapt over time. So as I'm listening to you, I'm very much hearing the opposite message of diet culture, which is certain foods are bad foods. I'm a bad person if I eat those foods. You're saying, let's focus on how we can add better foods in that are actually going to be nutrient dense, that are going to fuel my body. So it's not about deprivation. It's actually about focusing on fueling your body so that you can vibrate higher. That's a literal physical thing that our body does depending on the inputs it's getting, right? And that could be mindfulness things. It could be nutrition. It could be exercise, time in nature, a variety of different things. So I think that this approach is so, so revolutionary and such a message that we need for our time. And um, so with this, you have a little bit of background in Ayurveda like I do. And we've talked quite a bit about Ayurveda on the podcast. And one of the things that I'm really curious about with your approach to intuitive eating is how Ayurveda has come into that. And specifically with the dosha, so we have vata, pitta, and kapha. Those are, just for our listeners, they are basically constitution types. We all have a different Uh, kind of just way that our body is from birth, that it's the tendencies, it's going to be the weaknesses and the strengths that our body has. Um, So with Vata, it's, it's the combination of air and space. And Pitta is the combination of fire and water. And then Kapha is the combination of earth and water. And so depending on what your constitution type is, you're going to have different types of personality things going on, different types of, um, you know, things that you need to watch out for, but also certain things that you can leverage. So my dosha is vata pitta. And I know you were telling me yours the other day. Remind me what it is again. Well, I'm a pitta vata. Okay. (laughs) Very similar to me. So do you feel like with intuitive eating that it helps to know what your dosha is and how you're approaching that intuitive eating? Is the way that you approach mindfulness as a pitta going to be different than a kapha, do you think? Or do you just feel like mindfulness in general is important no matter what? I think it totally depends on the person, right? Like if that's overwhelming for you, then no, it's not helpful. It's not useful. Yeah. yeah. If, if it's helpful for you, just to a reminder, if you're not super in tune with your body yet and you need that kind of reminder of what foods to maybe stay away from and what foods will help balance out any imbalances, then then sure. Okay, good, good. So you don't have to feel like you're pigeonholed because you're a certain dosha, but if that information is helpful for you to know, it might actually help to bridge some of those gaps and help you to get to where you want to go maybe a little bit more quickly if that is going to be helpful for you to know what that is. I know for me, it does help me depending on the season. So like in fall, Mm -hmm. when we have a lot of vata, if I know that, then I know, okay, it's actually okay for me to eat a few more root vegetables just to bring in some of that earth element. Mm -hmm. And what I think is so interesting is that as soon as I do that, my body is just like, thank you. It's like the messages I'm getting back from my body. So it's kind of interesting how those ancient wisdom practices, whether it's Ayurveda or yoga or whatever, are really confirming of our relationship with that inner voice and our intuition in our body. So I just think it's really cool how it all fits together. I do too. And one of the things like I, I will, you know, teach people in intuitive eating is to eat with the season. So, mm-hmm. I mean, things grow in different seasons for different reasons, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. if you're eating those vegetables and those fruits that are in season that's Mm -hmm. typically going to be best for doshas and obviously like even though we might be you know vata pitta or pata pitta vata it's still you're going to follow those seasons that are more or more pitta or more vata and so you you might have an imbalance in one of those and be able to bring in the food Mm -hmm. that's needed to help it balance those or the spices or whatever right Right. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I just like, to me, it enriches my lifestyle. And for me, it makes it a little bit easier. So 
Um, I, that is one thing that I do is I help people figure out what their constitution type is. Is that something that you do in your work as well? If it's useful for them. I mean, I feel like I'm starting with so many people that are just such beginners that right. um, we might, we might talk about it, but it, I feel like it's a conversation for more, for most Later. people down the path a bit yep. more. Okay. Very good. Very good. So I'm curious to know, you've worked with a lot of people over the years, in addition to yourself and working through a lot of these things, what sort of non-physical positive results have you seen people have with intuitive eating? Uh, digestion, energy, skin health. Yeah. I mean, I, mood, um, just all of those things. I think those are probably the four strength, um, strength. Mm. less pain in their joints, mm -hmm. less uh, inflammation all over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there's hundreds, right? That there's uh, probably those are the big things that come to mind right away is people like, I have so much energy. I'm sleeping better. Mm. My digestion is on, like I, my digestion, it's working the way it's supposed to, you know, <laughs> those are, and those are huge things. Like, I mean, yeah. I can relate. And that was a huge thing. Like my whole life, I was constipated my whole life. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't remember a time since like 12 that I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then when I finally started eating this way, you know, four or five years ago, my body started working. Yeah. That's incredible. I mean, the joke used to be in my family when we'd be, go on vacation. Oh, we got to wait for mom to poop, you know? And it was like, it was miserable. <laughs> that yeah. is so funny. And I think that it, it just speaks to that whole thing that so many of us have internalized, that we can't trust our bodies. God, it's so funny. You said that I was driving home. Uh, this is way TMI, but it's fine, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's totally fine. Okay. Yep. It's like I was <laughs> driving home from my son's hockey game a couple hours away and I hadn't had a chance to go to the bathroom. And I'm literally like, I, I'm so used to it, but I still have a little like, oh, from when I used to be able to not go all the time. So I'm driving home and I go, I trust my body to know what it, it needs. I tr mm -hmm. I'm all the way home. Like, I trust my body. It's going to do what it needs to do. I trust it. I trust it. Like I, and I used to have to use like, like, I don't even know what they're called. Like just different things that would help you go to the bathroom, you know, yeah. it's just such a relief to know that you can trust your body. Oh yeah. I honestly feel like that's in many ways, the core wounding of many of us who have been part of diet culture for most of our life in one way, shape or form. And that wound healing takes time, but it's so powerful when it starts to heal mm -hmm. because you have these little tests of your faith that you get to make like this drive that you're doing where it's like, okay, I've given my body something different. I'm honoring it. I'm loving myself in a different way. What's going to happen? You know, and at first you're like, oh no, this isn't going to work or I'm going to be so <laughs> disappointed or things are going to go drastically wrong or I'm going to gain 40 pounds overnight or whatever it is that people are afraid of. But the body has its own innate wisdom that we really truly can tap into through mindfulness. And it is so cool to hear that something, I mean, that might seem like a simple thing unless you're a person who's ever had digestive issues and it can be very life altering all the time. So I think that's an incredible testimony and just speaks to the fact that health is not about, did I lose enough weight this year? Did I maintain my weight this year? There's nothing wrong with maintaining a healthy weight, but health is about so much more. It's about your joints working. It's about having energy and sleeping well. And sometimes when you do those things, the body will also release some excess weight. So not that that's the goal of intuitive eating, but have you seen that also happen for clients? Yeah, so much. I think when we can take the focus off what we look like and how much we hate our body. Yeah to shifting that towards love and honoring and mm -hmm. nourishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just magic starts to happen inside. Mm -hmm. And I think like one of the things I love for people to consider is when they do see somebody, a couple things, if it's okay. So a couple things, like if they do see that somebody has lost weight and they, they want to give them a compliment, maybe just saying like, Hey, I I've noticed you made some changes. How are you feeling? Oh, I love that. That's so life affirming. 
Yeah. And then how does that, that, you know, and that takes like, I feel like when people have lost weight, then there's so much pressure on them to keep going or mm -hmm. to, oh my gosh, everybody's giving me all of this praise when I'm losing weight. It's just so diet culture, right? Yes. So if we can start to shift that into like, how do you feel? Like what, mm. what, it, what's your energy, you know, whatever. So even just for the general public to start making that shift to how are you feeling would be so amazing. Yeah, for sure. So this all came to you from first starting to practice yoga, which I think is incredible. Like you went to that first hot yoga class in New York and now look, you have, you're working with people with nutrition, you're working with people with mindfulness, you're working with people with yoga. It's branched into this beautiful, soulful thing that your healing has now facilitated the potential for healing for so many others. I'm curious to know now where you are in your journey, even just thinking about yoga, what is your favorite yoga pose right now? And then I'm also curious to know, do you have any nemesis poses? And if so, how do you approach them? Um, yeah. Um, so my favorite yoga pose is probably half moon. Okay. And I just love the way I feel lengthened and long and strong and vulnerable all in one pose. That's um, great. Pose. So that's probably my favorite. Okay. And my nemesis is probably still and probably always has been um, this, and probably most hot yogis will say this as well. It's this one, it's called in hot yoga series, it's called half locust pose, where mm -hmm. <laughs> You are lying on your arms like this and you're on your belly and then you have to lift one leg and then the other leg and then both legs at the same time. And yeah. it's uncomfortable and I don't like it. Uh, and it's hard <laughs> and I feel like I'm suffocating. And um, so sometimes I skip it and, um, <laughs> and sometimes I just breathe through it, but yeah. Yeah. So when you have a nemesis pose like that and it, all of us have like mine's cow's face pose, I, I just literally like, I can do every other pose, but this one, I just, my body won't do it. And so sometimes I get really frustrated and sometimes I just try to let it go. So what do you tell students when they're feeling those moments of frustration on the mat with a pose? Uh, well, it depends on what, where the frustration is coming from. Ah. If frustration is coming from pain, mm -hmm. don't do it. Then that pose isn't right for you. Mm. If the frustration is coming from feeling like you have to look like everybody else doing it, close your eyes and just feel your way into the posture and mm -hmm. don't worry about what it looks like. And if the frustration is coming from um, just sometimes just not wanting to do it and feeling like it's not going anywhere, just breathe through it and let it be what it is and let it, and never force. Like, I think that's probably a good, probably in anything in life. That's a big mm -hmm. lesson I've learned over the last few years mm -hmm. is never push and force. Mm -hmm. And, um, discomfort is okay. Pain is not. Okay. Okay. And breathe. Well, yeah. And breathing. <laughs> also good advice for intuitive eating to not try to force things and to be more observant non-judgmentally about your current state versus feeling like you have to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. I've learned these things too on the yoga mat. So thank you for that honest share. It's good to hear even after all the people that you've trained and that you're working with that you still do have some of those nemesis poses. Um, I call them suffocating poses, just like, you know, those ones that are just really tough and everybody has it. And it again, speaks to the concept that everybody's body is different and even, mm -hmm. you know, your foods that work for you are not going to be the same as me. And the poses that are hard for you aren't going to be the same as the ones that are hard for me. But those hard things are the things that can really teach and instruct us sometimes in what we can heal, what we have the opportunity and the potential to heal. So what does it look like going forward for you now? So you've got this business and you're doing your own, you know, your own practices within this. I'm curious to know for 2021, what are you looking forward to this year? What are you hoping to bring forth into the world or stay consistent with? And what are your goals? Um, so I am working through my uh, 500 hour training right now. Wow. And wow. that's been a lot of fun. And the, one of the main focuses of that is the Kundalini and, um, we're actually, it's four things, which is really cool. Kundalini, Enneagrams, Ayurveda, and moon cycles. So I feel like I'm going to just 
finished with those. I've been adding a lot of Kundalini in and I really am obsessed with it. It's made a huge shift in just the few months that I've been focusing on that mm -hmm. in my personal practice. And I feel like in the classes that I teach as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think I'm being led towards more energy work and we'll see where that takes me. I'm just open to, um, seeing what's happened. I know I've done a lot of energy work, um, not on myself. I've had somebody do it for me and that's been pretty amazing. Life and altering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Life altering, just working yeah. through some big shifts. Um, yeah. so I think in everything, I think that the things that I am working towards is just allowing myself to, um, soak in what I'm learning and then offer up what's been useful to me or what I feel like could be useful for other people. Awesome. That's beautiful. Thank you. So I know people are going to want to find you after hearing this podcast and I definitely want them to know about your gym and what your current classes are. So why don't you share with us what you have on offer for people right now? Yeah, well, we do have some virtual, but we are not like primarily a virtual studio. So okay. I, we don't put a lot of focus into that. Um, mm -hmm. but my website is 180balance.com. I would say we're more active on uh, Facebook. So Facebook at 180balance.com or 180balance is there. Um, and I'm on Instagram personally as Misty May, M-A-E Yogi. Okay, great. And you are still coaching people for nutrition as well? Yeah, for sure. I love to work with people, but just know they're not going to get a meal plan in a... <laughs> 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 that's awesome. That's awesome. I think that's really beautiful. So they can feel free to reach out to you um, either at the gym or through your social media. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Misty. I feel like you really shared a lot of your heart with us today. And I know that that authentic share is going to really speak to so many people that are just ready to emerge from diet culture and really find a new way of being in this new year. And so I just really appreciate and honor what you've shared with us today and be sure to check Misty out at 180balance.com. If you're in the Detroit Lakes area, please get to these classes. They sound amazing. I wish I could go to hot yoga. That's one of my favorite things. And I would have to drive like two hours from where I live to go to one. So know. how far away do you live from me? Uh, pretty far. <laughs> <laughs> pretty far. Well, I can take a road trip sometime. Road trip over. sometime. Yeah. It's a good, good, a uh, good break to get out of the car on the way to Minneapolis and do a little, little hot yoga in Detroit Lakes. Um, so thanks again, Misty. And for those of you watching, please comment, like subscribe and hit that notification bell. And for those of you listening on your podcast app, I really do appreciate those five-star reviews and I will see you next time.